John chapter 7 and there we talked about where Jesus said if anyone thirsts let him come to me and drink and he who believes in me as the scripture has said out of him will flow rivers of living water and we did that at the ocean but Jesus said that fresh clean refreshing rivers of living water and of course he wasn't talking about our physical thirst um, we will get thirsty we'll drink our water again and again and again and that's a good thing but Jesus was talking about the thirst of our soul those things we long for that only he can fill well today we are going to pick up with John chapter 8 and we're going to learn about Jesus being the light of the world so go get your Bibles open to John chapter 8 and pray with me Heavenly Father we thank you for your time and your word we thank you that you are the living water and you're the only one who can satisfy our souls. And God, we pray that as we look at you being the light of the world and your amazing grace, we pray that you would teach us, that you would fill us, and that you would change us and make us more like you. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone agreeing said, Amen. So we finished last week actually with John chapter 8, verse 1, but back up to 753, and it says, And everyone went to his own house. Verse 1 of chapter 8, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And remember, he went to the Mount of Olives because he didn't own a house here on earth. And we talked about how he slept under the stars, those very stars that he made in the very garden that he made. Verse 2, now early in the morning, he came again into the temple and all the people came to him. And he sat down and taught him. It's a neat thing to get up early in the morning and come to Jesus just like these people did it's a good thing to get up your first thing in the day and pray to God and spend time with him and spend time in the word it said and all the people came now all the people that means yes those religious leaders were there listening but it also meant those multitudes that we had talked about and they came into the temple and it says and he sat down and taught them now, when we're in class, and you're probably sitting right now, I'm standing. I usually stand when I teach, but sometimes I sit. In the synagogue, it would have been normal for the people to stand. So everybody, right now, wherever you're at, stand up. And it would have been normal for the teacher to sit when he taught. And so that's how it would have been. It would have been standing like you, and Jesus sat down and taught them. Verse 3, then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now you will remember from our study at the of the 10 commandments that adultery is a married person who is, is acting like they're married to somebody else. In this case, this woman was acting like she was married to somebody else. And the law says that that person should be stoned for that. God takes our marriage vows very seriously, but 
we will see here Jesus' response to this woman. And they called him teacher. And in verse 5, Now Moses in the law commanded us that such a one should be stoned. But what do you say? Now, no, they were not concerned about this woman. They were not concerned about this woman's marriage. They, look at verse 6, they said this, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. Remember, these are the religious leaders that were doing that. It would have been really nice if they were more concerned about this woman and helping her in her marriage and her husband and getting things right, but they weren't. They were just testing Jesus. But, verse, look in the middle of verse 6, but Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So they're here, they group of men brought this woman and they're saying she's caught in the very act of this sin. What are you going to do, Jesus? Because the law, the law of God in the Old Testament said that she was to be stoned. So Jesus says, as though he didn't hear, he stooped down and he started writing in the dirt. And it says, so when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to him, He who is out sin among you, let him throw the first stone at her. So back in verse 5, it says that Moses in the law commanded us that such a one be stoned. And then he's also quoting the law here. He who is out sin among you, let him throw a stone at her. He's referencing um, the law in Deuteronomy 17 7 it talks it break that down Deuteronomy 17 7 you can look it up then and it talks about how the accuser of a person is to be the one that would throw the first stone and so maybe these guys even had stones in their hand I don't know the Bible doesn't tell us that and then it says that verse 8 and again he stooped down and wrote on the ground what do you think Jesus was writing on the ground? The Bible doesn't tell us, but I have a feeling, based upon their actions, that Jesus may have been writing their sin in the ground. Because, look what it says. It says, and again he stooped down and wrote on the ground, verse 9, and those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. So as Jesus wrote on the ground and said, you who have no sin, you cast the first stone, they left. The oldest, the oldest would have had more sin in his life because he would have lived longer than the others and they went out first. Again, the Bible doesn't tell us specifically what Jesus wrote on the ground, but we do see the actions of these religious leaders from when Jesus did write on the ground. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. So they all left, nobody harmed the woman, and Jesus was there with her. When Jesus has raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, verse 11, no one, Lord. She called him Lord. Remember what the religious teachers called him? They called him teacher. They should have. When Jesus was writing in the ground, their, possibly writing their sin, why didn't they say, how does this man know so much? They should have bowed down and said, Lord, forgive me, for I am a sinner. But they, they didn't do that. But they did stop accusing her, and they walked away. When we see that, we see here that Jesus is the only sinless one. He is the only one that could have stoned her. But look what he said instead. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And we see God's amazing grace in Jesus' response. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now some of you might be sitting there and say, well, I'm not married. I don't need to worry about this. I'm certainly not committing adultery. 
Well, the exact sin isn't the focus here. The exact, the, the sin, the fact that there is sin is the focus. And sin is what we all have done. How many of you can sit there and say, you've never lied, or you've never stole something, or you've never been disrespectful to mom and dad? All those are commandments, just like adultery is commandment. Each of those are commandments. And so none of us is without sin. And the exact sin isn't the focus. It's what do we do with that sin? Do we continue in it? Do we continue sinning? Do we hide it and try not to let anybody see it? Or do we confess it? That is the best thing. The Bible tells us that if we confess our sin, that God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's because of our sin that Jesus came and died on the cross. And even though in this section in chapter 8, Jesus hadn't yet been to the cross, he is showing this woman he still died for her sin. He died for all sin, past, present, and future. He died for all the sin. And he shows us amazing grace when he says to this woman, and he says to us when we confess our sin, and he says, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. Jesus said to her, go and sin no more. When she was in her sin, it was like she was in the darkness. Can you see me? I'm in the dark right now. And that is like being in our sin. But I've got a few things of light here I want to show you. I have this light. You know what these are, the glow sticks. That adds a little bit of light, doesn't it? And then I have a little laser. That's not much light at all. This one shines a little bit more, but we're not finished yet. Look at the big flashlight. Oh, that one shines a lot of light. And then we have the lantern that shines even brighter. Now then, think about if the sun would come out, it would completely dispel the darkness. And that's what light does. Light dispels the darkness. It also leads the way. So if it, we were out here in the dark and I were to turn on my lantern, then it would lead us exactly where we wanted to go. So light dispels. That means it gets rid of the darkness, but it also leads the way. Let's look at verse 12. It says, then Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. When Jesus says, he who follows me, it means he, the people, he or she, who have given their lives to Jesus to follow him and trust in him. And he says that he's the light of the world. And when he is the light of the world, in, in Matthew, it says that we are also to the light of the world and that we are to let our light shine before others in such a way that they will see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. So if you are in Jesus, is your light shining brightly? Sometimes when we're with him, we start to go away from a little bit. Maybe we stop reading our Bible so much. Maybe we stop praying. Maybe we stop worshiping him. And then that light, it starts to dim. Don't let your light go out for Jesus. Shine brightly for him. Stay in his word. Stay worshiping him. Stay praying to him and let his light shine. Now the next few verses, I'd like you to read on your own. And if you have any questions about them at all, feel free to contact me and let me know. But before we end here, I want to look together at verse 24, where Jesus said, Jesus is speaking here, and he says, Therefore, I say to you, that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die 
in your sins. That is a sad thing to hear because we don't want to die in our sins. We want to, when, when we leave, when our physical bodies are no more, we want to be know that we are going to spend forever in heaven with Jesus. And we can know that when we give our lives to him, when we follow him and let his light shine brightly in us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the light of the world. And we pray and ask that you would help us to shine brightly for you and have your light shine through us, God. I pray for anyone who does not know you, that they would commit their lives to you today, that they would follow you, and that they would have the light of Jesus in their lives as well. God, we love you. We thank you for this time. And we pray and ask that you would continue to help us to walk in in you. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody agreeing said, Amen. See you next time. for me